Good evening. Uh, welcome everybody and an especially warm welcome to our friends and partners in the Living Knowledge Network across the UK. Uh, my name's Jamie Andrews. Uh, I lead here at the British Library on our cultural programming and our learning and education work. Uh, I'm delighted, we're all delighted to welcome back the Penn Pinter Prize into the British Library for the 2020 prize giving ceremony. Uh, you can see probably I'm here in the British Library in London. Uh, we are reopening our sites in London and in the North. Uh, and here in our London site in St Pancras, many of our reading rooms and our exhibitions are open. And we have a major new show, Unfinished Business, The Fight for Women's Rights, that launches shortly. Uh, but for obvious reasons, our cultural events programming has gone digital this year. And that's different, uh, of course it is. Uh, we'll miss the warmth of all your human presence and company and energy. Uh, it's different, but by no means a diminution. Uh, indeed, quite the opposite. Uh, already with our digital online programme, we found that we're reaching more people than ever we could in a physical theatre, more people from across more of the UK uh, and in a more open and I think inclusive way. So those circumstances have forced our hand uh, we hope and truly believe that this year's Penn Pinter Awards will be the biggest and the best yet. Uh, the Penn Pinter Prize, it's been hosted here at the British Library since 2009. Uh, it was established in memory of Harold Pinter. Uh, Harold was a great friend of ours and his archive lives on here at the library. Uh, the awards awarded annually to a writer of outstanding literary merit. I'd just like to thank everyone who's made this event happen, my colleagues here at the library in our cultural events team, our friends and longtime partners at English Pen, and of course, last uh, but not least, and in fact, most importantly, all our thanks and admiration to Antonia Fraser. So have a wonderful evening, I'm sure you will. Uh, and now with great pleasure, I'll hand over to the president of English Pen, Philippe Sands. Hello, I'm Philippe Sands and I'm very delighted to welcome you on behalf of English Pen and Lady Antonia Frazier to this year's Pen Pinter Prize Award Ceremony. It's the 12th such ceremony and it's founded in honour and memory of Harold Pinter, the wonderful writer, to celebrate writing and writers who fulfil his vision as set out in his Nobel Prize winning speech when he spoke about our obligation to define what he called the real truth of our lives through unflinching, unswerving, fierce intellectual engagement. We're so very pleased to be holding this ceremony once again in partnership with the British Library, which holds the Pinter Archive. And I want to thank warmly Claire Armistead, Charmaine Lovegrove and Max Porter for their wonderful judgment in selecting Linton Quasi Johnson as the winner of the Pen Printer Prize 2020. I've known his writings, I don't know him personally, and they've inspired me for so many years, but I really like what the judges said of his work. He's a poet, reggae icon, academic, campaigner, whose impact on the cultural landscape of the last half century has been colossal and multi-generational. His political ferocity and his tireless scrutiny of history are truly Pinteresque, as is the humour with which he pursues them. I want to thank warmly the British Library for hosting the award and making it possible to be held for the first time in this way online. The prize would not be possible without the support of very generous funders. And I would like to thank in particular the Blavatnik Family Foundation and Ruth Maxted. Special thanks also are due to the cartoonist, my friend, Martin Rosen, who traditionally draws a cartoon on some cricketing theme in homage to Harold Printer, which is presented to the winner. Our thanks also to Jay Bernard for their new commission in tribute to Linton Quasi Johnson, which is going to be premiered this evening. Thank you, Dottie Irving, Truda Sprite and Alexander Hamilton of Four Communications for helping English Pen to publicise the prize. The Pen Pinter Prize asks the winner in association with English Pen's Writers at Risk programme to choose a fellow international writer who shares the prize. Linton Quasi Johnson will announce the winner late in the evening. 
on behalf of English Pen and its wonderful membership as we approach our centenary year on which you'll be hearing more in due course. It's my very great pleasure to introduce Professor Paul Gilroy, Professor of Humanities and Founding Director of the Sarah Parker Remen Centre for the Study of Racism and Racialization, to the stage to introduce this year's winner. Professor Gilroy. I would like to thank English Pen for the opportunity to participate in this ceremony and, in particular, for the chance to put my profound appreciation of Linton Kwesi Johnson's literary and political achievements on record. Johnson's poems accomplished a rare feat. They explored the life experience of a marginalised group poetically with such power that the work won recognition not only as compelling and beautiful, but as faithful. In other words, his poetry was understood to be truthful. That judgment was made immediately, close to the moment of expression, not awarded four decades and more later with the benefit of hindsight. In the vernacular philosophical language of the Black Freedom Movement, to which Johnson's work has made such notable contributions, the idea of truth is linked to the pursuit of right and rights. And there is a loud, unruly demand for justice here too. It has endured beyond the historical circumstances from which it emerged. My own relationship with Linton's poetry really began with the publication of his second volume of poems, Dread, Beat and Blood. The impact of that encounter was formative. I was delighted by it and shocked that there were so many resonances with my own outlook, my observations and experiences. Things that had appeared to be personal and subjective were charged with a wider significance. A Fanonian revolutionary politics distinguished by its determination to take the question of culture seriously was clearly audible, but that insurgent spirit had been melded into a mode of modernist expression. It was influenced by militant voices from the United States Black Arts Movement, but also seemed in places to be signifying on the work of the most revered of modernist poets. The patois voice was dominant, but it was not the only voice. This was a polyvocal, a populist modernism, equally appreciative of the demotic poetry of the reggae toasters and the lyrical heights of records half heard through the fog of intoxication in the blues dance. It was tuned into political and historical commentary on Britain via the wordplay of the Jamaican sufferer DJs, Iroy, Big U. Its romantic elements were counterpointed by an italic, a dubwise sensibility. Long before the musical components of Linton's performances were formalised through his bardic collaborations with the legendary Dennis Bovell, our Mozart, and a number of others, there was an implicit music here. That music was reggae, though not only reggae, because reggae itself was changing. It was growing and responding to African-American and other Black Atlantic influences. In the parties and dances, the rhythm side, the version side of the 45, was becoming a dub cut. What Linton named bass culture, characterised by a playful mix of comedy and menace, was slowly giving way to the extreme seriousness of what can only be called a dub aesthetic. The pointed, pleasurable undoing of familiar song structure and sound, which had become routine, was now being associated with an analogous process of creativity in language. Linton's writing took poetry beyond the definition of verse as a sequence of figures of spoken sound. Dubwise, his words let us hear the sound of bursting out of slave shackles. Scatter, matter, shatter, shack, what a beat. The results of these innovations was absolutely faithful to the lived experience of young black people during that time of ferment and conflict, especially with the police. Dread Beaten Blood included a poem livicated to the memory of David Oluwale, killed by the only British police officers ever brought to book for their cruelty. Oluwale's is a name like those of Asseta Sims, Blair Peach, Mark Duggan and many, many others that should be as famous and celebrated in this country as those of George, George Floyd and the other African-Americans who've met similar fates. Looking back 40 years and more, 
Linton Johnson's work not only makes a valuable bridge between the generation of the Caribbean artist movement, Andrew Salkey, Kamal Braithwaite, Bongo Jerry, John LaRose, and the revolutionary moment of the 1970s. It also constitutes a vibrant link with contemporary concerns, which appear different when placed in the light of Linton's own life and writing as a settler who cultivated art which could resonate at both ends of his journey. This poetry took the substance of worthless, racialized lives and made it poetic as part of larger struggles to win recognition, dignity, worth and humanity itself from a machine that did not perceive black people as human and saw young blacks only as a criminal problem. Rereading Johnson's early work, we can discover him finding his own voice and finding ours on our behalf. It's rare for a poet to speak so authentically and so authoritatively. His great achievement is that without, I imagine, intending to do so, he became something like the voice of a whole generation. I'm delighted to be presenting the 2020 Penn Pinter Prize to Linton Quasi Johnson. When Penn founded the prize, just after Harold died in 2008, immediately I thought it was a brilliant idea. The idea of a writer who speaks out, a great writer, and who also has great compassion for uh, sufferers from human rights of any sort. And that was Harold. And, and that's why Linton Crazy Johnson is such a very good person to receive it this year, because he's got all those qualities. He speaks out, and he's also got another quality which he shares with Harold. He's got humor. Harold cared passionately about human rights, but he also liked humor. So I think they have a lot in common. And therefore, with much pleasure, I give it to you. Well, I'm very pleased to have um, been awarded the English Pen Pinter Prize. I'm not gonna make a big speech, only to say that um, I wasn't really aware of what a big deal it was until people kept on sending me messages of congratulations from all over the place. One inquisitive friend in Jamaica asked, how much money are you getting, Linton? Because I know the English are very mean. And I said, not a lot. I said, the prize is, the money is small, but the honor is huge. Okay, so I'm going to um, recite a few poems here, which might give some indication of why I've been selected for this prestigious prize. And um, they're, they're from my collection of poems, um, selected poems, which are dealing with the black experience in Britain throughout the 70s, 1970s, 1980s, to the end of the 20th century. Now, when I was a, a youth growing up, it was clear, perfectly clear to the black youth of my generation that the police, the metropolitan police force had declared war against us. And in, in a sense, that war has been a protracted one because even my grandson's generation are subjected to that war. Indeed, nowadays, even if you are a world-class athlete with a young baby, or um, a serving police officer, or indeed a member of parliament, once you're black, you're not immune to police intimidation and harassment. But during the 1970s, um, in the war that the police were waging against my generation, one of the weapons they used was a piece of legislation called the Vagrancy Act, which goes back to the time of Queen Victoria. 
But we, we, we knew this law in our community as the SUS law, SUS being short for suspicion. Invariably, you would be arrested and charged with attempting to steal from persons unknown. And there was a campaign to get rid of this unjust law. Um, I know a lot of um, mothers from Lewisham were involved in that campaign. Anyway, I contributed this poem called Sonny's Letter. Brixton Prison, Jeb Avenue, London Southwest 2, England. Dear Mama, good day. I hope that when these few lines reach you, they may find you in the best of health. Mama, I really don't know how to tell you this, cause I did make a solemn promise to take care of little Jim and try my best to look out for him. Mama, I really did try my best, but nonetheless, me sorry to tell you, say, poor little Jim, get a rest. It was the middle of the rush hour when everybody just a hustle and a bustle to go home for them evening shower. Me and Jim stand up waiting for a bus, not causing no fuss when all on a sudden, a police van pull up. Out jump three policemen, the whole of them carrying baton. Them walk straight up to me and Jim. One of them hold on to Jim, so I'm taking him in. Jim tell him to let go of him, for him not do nothing, and him not a thief, not even a button. Well, Jim start to wriggle. The police start to giggle. Mama, I can tell you what them do to Jim. Mama, I can tell you what them do to him. Them thump him in him belly and it turn to jelly. Them lick him pan him back and him rib get pop. Them lick him pan him head but it tough like lead. Them kick him in him seed and it started to bleed. Mama, I just couldn't stand up there and I do nothing. So me juk one in him eye and him started to cry. Me thump one in him mouth and him started to shout. Me kick one pan him shin and him started to spin. Me thump him pan him chin and him drop pan a bin and crash. And dead. Mama, more policemen come down and beat me to the ground. Them charge Jim Fissus. Them charge me to murder. Mama, don't fret. Don't get depressed and down heartily. Be of good courage till I hear from you. I remain your son, Sonny. In the history of the black experience in Britain, in the post-World War II period. The most significant date is the year 1981, because in that year, um, we had the insurrections and uprisings and riots in all of the inner city areas of England, beginning in Brixton. Uh, we had the Black People's Day of Action on the 2nd of March, 1981, which was the greatest expression of black political power ever seen in this country in the 20th century. Between 15 to 20,000 people marched from New Cross in Southeast London to Hyde Park to protest the death, the killing, the racist, fascist murder of 13 young black people um, and the year had in fact begun with the actual um, fire at 439 New Cross Road, which we call the New Cross Massacre. Anyway, in spite of the efforts of the gutter press and some of the broadsheets, 
um, with their campaign of lies and disinformation, the New Cross Massacre Action Committee was still able to mobilize between 50, 15 to 20,000 people and shut down a lot of London on the 2nd of March, 1981. Well, this next poem is called, this poem is called The New Cross Massacre. It's a long poem, so I'm not gonna do all of it. I'm just gonna give you, um, I'm just gonna do bits of it. Um, first, the coming and the going in and out of the party. The dubbing and a rubbing and a rocking to the rhythm. The dancing and the skanking and the party really swinging. The laughing and the talking and the styling in the party. The moving and a grooving and a dancing to the disco. The joking and the jiving and the joy of the party. Then the crash and the bang and the flame start to trunk. The heat and the smoke and the people start to choke. The screaming and the crying and the dying in the fire. The panic and the pushing and the boring through the fire. The running and the jumping and the flames, them rising higher. The weeping and the moaning or the horror of the fire. 1982 was um, a significant year in my own personal life. Um, My father, who never came to England, who remained in Jamaica, lived in the ghettos of West Kingston. My father died that year at the age of 56. And um, I wrote a, an elegy for him, which really is also a poem about Jamaica during the early 1980s. It's called Reggae Fidada. Galang Dada, Galang Gwan Yasa. You never had no life to live, just the one life to give. You did your time upon earth, you never get your just dessert. Galango smile in the sun, Galango sata in the palace of peace. Oh, the water it's so deep, the water it's so dark, and it's full of harbor shark. The land is like a rock slowly shattering to sand, sinking in a sea of calamity, where fear breeds shadows that lurks in the dark. Where people afraid for walk, afraid for think, afraid for talk. Where the present is haunted by the past. A desa me born, get to know about storm, learn to cling to the dawn. And when me hear my daddy sick, me quickly pack my grip and take a trip. Me never have no time when me reach. For sin or sunny beach when me reach. Just people are living shock, people living back to back, monks, cockroach and rat, monks, dirt and disease, subject to terrorist attack, political intrigue, constant grief, and no sign of relief. Oh, the grass turned brown, so many trees cut down, and the land is overgrown. From country to town is just this land torn in the wound of the poor. It's a miracle how them endure the pain night and day, the stench of the care, the glaring sights of guarded affluence, the arrogant vices called eyes of contempt, the mocking symbols of independence. A desomy barn. Get to know about storm, learn to cling to the dawn. And when the news reached me, send me one daddy dead, they catch a plane quick. 
And when me reached my sunny isle, it was the same old style. The money well dry, the bullets them a fly, plenty innocent a die, many rivers run dry, ganja planes flying high. The poor man him a try, you think a little try him try, holding on by and by, when a dollar can buy a little dinner for a fly. Galang dada, galang guan yasa. You never had no life to live, just the one life to give. You did your time on earth, you never get your just dessert. Galango smile in the sun, Galango sata in the palace of peace. Me know you couldn't take it, Dada. The anguish and the pain, the suffering, the problems, the strain. Struggling in vain to make two ends meet so that them picnic could I get a little something to eat. To put clothes upon them back, to put shoes upon them feet. When a dollar can buy a little dinner for your fly. I know you try, Dada. You fight a good fight, but the dice them did loaded and the card pack fix. Yet still, you reach 56 before you lose your leg wicket. I know you're born grown here, so we bury you a stranger's burying ground. Near to mum and cousin Darius, not far from the quarry, down at August Town. The next poem is called New Word Order. And how I came to write this poem was that um, I can't remember exactly when, towards the end of the 90s, that the term um, ethnic cleansing gained currency. But it's, it's an expression that I, I hate with a passion. Because um, when, when, when you talk about ethnic cleansing, you're presupposing that there is a, something called ethnic pollution. And as far as I'm concerned, to my simple way of, 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 of thinking, that is the dehumanization of language and the language of dehumanization. Language is we define our humanity through language. And it's very, very important that we're very careful about how we use language. You know, it's, it's almost like um, a normalization of bestiality, you know, ethnic cleansing. So, um, new word order. And, and it's, it's, it refers, you know, it's, it's, it, it's not just the, 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 the fact that the term had gained currency that inspired the poem. There were some acts of barbarism going on in the late 80s. In late 80s, um, early 90s, in the period just before and in the period immediately after the end of the Cold War. That is the context of the poem. The killers of Kigali must be sanitary workers. The butchers of Butari must be sanitary workers. The savages of Chatila must be sanitary workers. The beasts of Bosnia must be sanitary workers. In the new word order. Like a dirty old bandage upon the festering face of humanity, the old order unravel and reveal, old scar just a broke out in a new sore. Primeval wound that time won't heal, and in the ancient currency of blood, tribal tyrants a second world score. The killers of Kigali must be sanitary workers. The butchers of Butari must be sanitary workers. The savages of Chatila must be sanitary workers. The beasts of Bosnia 
must be sanitary workers in the new world order. And it's the same old Cain and Abel syndrome, far more ancient than the fall of Rome. But in the new world order of atrocity is a brand new language of barbarity. Mass murder normalize, pogrom rationalize, genocide sanitize, and the ancient clan sin. No name ethnic cleansing. And so the killers of Kigali must be sanitary workers. The butchers of Butari must be sanitary workers. The savages of Chatilla must be sanitary workers. The beasts of Bosnia must be sanitary workers. Prapram pram! In the new world order. So, I'm just going to do one more. Because it's the... Um, it's the first poem I wrote in the 21st century because I wrote, that, I wrote this poem in the year 2000. Um, and it was a poem for a member of parliament for Tottenham, Bernie Grant, the late Bernie Grant. And uh, I wrote this as an elegy for him when he died. Bernie Grant, in 1987, the first four post-World War II black members of parliament who were elected were Keith Vaz, Diane Abbott, um, Paul Boating, and Bernie Grant. Of the four um, of those pioneering members of parliament, Bernie Grant was the only one who really had any grassroots support because he'd, he'd been a counselor in Tottenham um, for many years. And um, he was very popular uh, in the black communities up and down the country. And the poem is called B BG for Bernie Grant in memoriam, 1934 to 2000. Like a skilled tradesman, you pave the way. From the shop floor to the council chamber, all the way up to parliament front door. And then you enter as a member. And we remember the ruption over Tottenham, Mrs. Jarrett heart attack, down a brick stand, detective love lock, shot cherry gross in her back. The rage and the storm, the death of P.C. Blakelock, Broad Water Farm. You was with Chief, you was with Chice, you was with Champion. You was with Fierce, you was with Vice, you was with me and Man. And we remember how the press and the rest try to lynch you. How them try to tar and feather you. How the Haring gave a massive rally round you. How you make black people feel proud of you. And we remember how you build the unity in your community. Dedicate yourself to your constituency. Brace your broad back against bigotry and stand firm for justice and equality. You was with chief, you was with choice, you was with champion. You was with fierce, you was with vice, you was with main man. Them said that if you're going into politics, you have to well tough and can take enough licks. You was with Ali in a prime. You jab them with your left, you hook them with your right, and you take truth force and beat them every time. Now it sounds like louder bells are trying to toll your tail, but I fear your precedent are going to prevail. Them no know how the person get him gone. But I'll know me still are here for your son. You was with chief, you was with choice, you was with champion. You was with fierce, you was with vice, you was with number one. Keeping a citizen incarcerated, incommunicado, 
without charge or trial for nearly 20 years is the kind of egregious brutality that we associate with totalitarian states and dictatorships. From the list of worthy nominees, as a gesture of solidarity from a poet of the African diaspora, I have chosen the Eritrean poet, songwriter, critic, and journalist, Emmanuel Asrat, as the writer of Courage for 2020. Dear English pen members, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased, honored, and humbled to accept this award on behalf of my brother, Emmanuel Asra. Special thanks and warmest congratulations to this year's Penn Pinter Prize winner, the extraordinary Linton Gracie Jensen, who chose to share the prize with Emmanuel Asra. Thanks to English Pen and Pen Eritrea. It is with mixed feelings that I'm accepting the award today. I'm extremely glad my brother was chosen to receive the award on one side. On the other side, it pains me that my brother, a young and promising poet and courageous journalist is still suffering under the harsh conditions of the dungeons in Eritrea for 19 years and counting. Note that the international community is still silent while Emmanuel and many more others remain behind the bars in Eritrea for just expressing their political opinions and practicing their faith. The sole crime of Emmanuel and the other prisoners of conscience in Eritrea is standing for truth and justice. Having said that, let me give you an insight into who Emmanuel Asrat was. Before that, let me say something about Eritrea, also known as African North Korea. Eritrea is a Northeast African country on the Red Sea coast. It shares borders with Ethiopia, Sudan, and Djibouti. Eritrea became an independent country after longest struggle on the continent in 1991. Since its independence, Isaiah Saforki and his sole party PFDJ are ruling the country with iron fist. Eritrea is ruled by fear and not by law, as UN investigation has indicated. There is no freedom of press, no freedom of speech, no freedom of faith, and no freedom of assembly in the country. As per the UN report, there are more than 10,000 prisoners of conscience in the, in the country. Some say the actual number is three times more. My brother, Eritrean journalist and poet Emmanuel Asret, has been incarcerated since September 23, 2001, in an undisclosed maximum security prison along with other journalists and former government officials who demand reform. Emmanuel, born in July 1971, was a graduate of soil science and water conservation. He's credited for Eritrea's poetry resurgence of 2000s. An award-winning poet and critic, Amaniel, with two colleagues, has founded grassroots literary clubs, clubs around across the country. Amid the political crackdown and banning of the private newspapers, Amania was taken into custody in the morning of September 23, 2001. Apart from under unauthorized rumors, mainly through former prison guards who have fled the country, the whereabouts of Amania and his colleagues is unknown and there has never been an official statement by the Eritrean authorities. I have no doubt in mind that you can imagine 
how painful it is for parents to lack information about whereabouts of their child for 19 years and counting. This award will help Amaniel assume his proper place and due re recognition internationally. I wish Amaniel could somehow be aware of this threat of this tremendous honor and recognition. This award will also serve to uplift the spirit of our family. Thank you, English Pen, and all for keeping Amaniel in your thoughts and prayers. Moreover, Thank you for constantly remembering and reaching Amaniel's family. Thank you all again. Abasa Kinat Hadanagar Gwazimu Hadanagar Tadahiu Nihidat Besiu Hadanagarak Alihu Abtakil Tahuat Zimahala Lufula أبتخل التحواس زرا خوبلا أبتخل التحواس زوار سوبلا أبقرعات يوتن موتن أبوش مت أفعتن لمعتن أبسنجرو سلامن شاولتن تأرقيرو حادة نقر تداهيو سعو حانت فرزر إيو جعان سراون ناتا سافئ مشالان بلتقون ناتا قونان إيو زوكبو سئنو حد حدو نات بلا لعه بسربي نبعات تسوقيدا كاب نبسا قوميدا نبسا تقوميدا كاب نبسا نبسا زريقا عبت زاقيت زي تفرشحي عبتي اينا اينا من زي فلي وحز دمن ماين تتخيلا بتا زرقن بغا زحي تصحي بزي سكن سربي بفحشواي برقي بزند زناب تعجبا قعقلت أم حد سينا مد سين سلغا مل أكا موت تقيرا مخون هيوات حنقيرا النهور كباب زمرا اتا زر ايه كابت زي تفرشحيه دمن ماين نايمن نمن زي تقلله مايكو عقو زي لله بعلا بزيحا عبت زمرا خطف الله عبت زمرا قن يا مانا انت مع دوت نسو سب اي تاجحني اغا ما انت مع دوت نسو مريت نسا تخلي دنسيوا غرامي تعنجيلا تدنادينا زريا خاسي املا مسمن كتصقع ابي كتدبي نبيا كتدمع نبيا قدربي تزمراغن حماو تزي مصباو بافت ييت حاريسو كعبو هيو تفسيسو حلفت كابتن فاس غولغيلو نموت بموت عصيدو ابزبان غولو داخيدو اماسيو و اماسيو نتافري ابسق اتفليو اتافري معلتن ليتن حدا يخينوا شاقلتن رفتن تحاويسوا علم ما وشت علم كنا توشت سلام امنات اب حقا زلو طلمت مسرعيت دنسيوا دنسيوا ودم سندينا ازمرا خينات تا ابسنتو نبعت ادين ولادا نبعت اندا نتارستا نبعت مريت نمريتا وحزو 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 مزاري بايتا مستقوى مستقوى ناوتي شميمو نقوم مسلمو مسراسي عشابو فريو باديلا افرزا عشابو فلفلو مجنزق الرزا يقداز عشابو دما يهلوخ كل يشامو كلنا ندليو كلنا نوننو نقر كنا تتخفقو ازمرو خيد لخيو متزبطح فانت اقار مقالوحو معتخا متزخوح شعيو شعيو ابسا خينات ابسا زقا مادح جنا 
كيف تخا تساسيو كي دلخا تساليو ارحقو كحطم كن ابيت ابيت تصليو امانيل اسرات شحنت جاتن ايتن تيت انت جاتن the scourge of war something growled something boomed invading the calm it echoed stuck where two brothers pass each other by, where two brothers meet, where two brothers join in the piazza of life and death. In the gulf between calamity and culture, in the valley of anxiety and peace, something boomed. While the cheer and soror acacias spat at each other, sorghum and millet cut each other down, with no one to collect them, they feed on one another, until a single seed remains, brimming with tears, being chopped, hacked, sowed unto itself, planted in earth yet to gush in that indiscernible thing stream of blood and water the seed assailed by the freezing sun tempestuous nimbus cloud grayish lighting scalding rain slipping through littered iron climbing onto the spirit of death shouldering its sterile life here it has grasped at spring the seed arrived on its own from the blood and water yet to gush whose and to whom unascertained, its tributaries unidentifiable, when it parted that spring. But in that spring, when the seed looked to the right, he was a man, it was a beard. When it looked to the left, he was the earth, it was a seed, bewildered. It fed on amazement, tempted, but joining forces is not like it. Who should stick with? Who should it stick with? Where should it lurk? Who should it win over or be thrown at? but that spring's dirtiness is its ugliness. It ploughed with the beak of bullets, spilled infinite lives, swept breath, reaped death with death, threshing it on the shoulders of our offspring, finally bruised the fruit in distrust for the fruit. When day and night became one, anxiety and calm mingled, a world within a world, war within peace, trust in betrayal's back door, it sunk in bewilderment, is it not bewildering? The scourge of this spring of war after a mother's tear for her children, the clan's tear for its time, the earth's tear for the earth, flowed and flowed like a stream. Soon the earth became wet and muddy, the property mired, entrapping all, robbing them. Then the shovel and the pick were produced and the shroud and the stretcher sprang up, but how fast everything is used up and everyone scrambles for us. All of us crave and own it. The ugliness of this thing, war, when its spring arrives unwished for, when its ravaging echoes knock at your door, it is then that war's curse brews doom. But you serve it willy-nilly, unwillingly you keep it company. Still, you pray so hard for it to be silenced. Thank you all for joining us for this wonderful ceremony. And on behalf of English Pen, I'd like to offer my deepest congratulations to Linton Quasi Johnson and Emmanuel Azrad, the winners of this year's Pen Pinter Prize. It's also been an honor to be joined by Emmanuel's family this evening. Sincere thanks too to my fellow judges of this year's prize, Charmaine Lovegrove and Max Porter, whose clarity and unanimity in selecting Linton as our winner was an absolute joy. Thanks also to the British Library and to all the supporters of English Pen who make our work possible. In particular, our core funders, Arts Council England, the T.S. Eliot Foundation, the Sigrid Rousing Trust, our Silver Pen and Project Partners, and of course, above all, our members. As a membership organisation, we depend especially on these members to support our mission to be fiercely independent, international in outlook and deeply engaged in current and vital conversations around freedom of expression in the UK and also internationally. We wish you could all be with us in person for this very special occasion. But as we celebrate the work of this year's winners, we also think of the many others who cannot be with us, even virtually. We think of our imprisoned colleagues around the world, including Nedim Turfent in Turkey, Najez Mohammadi in Iran, and former pen pin to writers of courage, Raif Badawi and Walid Abu Kair of Saudi Arabia. Writer to writer solidarity has long been at the heart of Penn's work in support of writers imprisoned or otherwise at risk. 
And tonight's celebration is, of course, no exception. For decades, members of PEN have supported fellow writers in countless ways, including sending letters of solidarity. The impact of such simple acts cannot be underestimated, and countless writers have told us how much this support has meant to them. Ahead of English PEN's centenary next year, we're delighted to launch our new campaign, PEN Writes, a year-long letter-writing campaign in solidarity with writers at risk around the world. We invite all of you to join us in celebrating and supporting writers of courage across the globe, including this year's International Writer of Courage and our first featured writer of PEN Writes, Emmanuel Azrat, by writing messages of support to them and also to their families. You can find more details of the campaign as well as other activities in our exciting centenary programme, Common Currency, on English Pen's website. Our members are critical to us continuing this important work. So if you have not already joined English Pen, we ask that you consider doing so. And now to close the ceremony, I'm honored to introduce Jay Bernard, who will be reading a newly commissioned piece they've created specially for this occasion. England Street, Reggae for Linton, The front line in the 80s started here. On Railton Road that leads up to Hearn Hill, a bridge. A skeleton that stands above the clouds, deserted once, now demolished, now sold. The soul of not so long ago remains, if you know Poet's Corner, branching from the main and back suburban roads. All scepters stretched from Loughborough to Ephra to Tulse Hill was once the scene of war, of lightning in the land. Those voices, cold, now mingled with the mud, are conjured by their name. Each street a tomb and dub is that same echo remix then delayed by slow filtration, one time through the smoke and sweat, two times through the hostile staring crowds until somewhere the inspiration strikes. Night sweats and tradition mark the voice that sings most clearly that which Chaucer wrote and Shakespeare knew. The drum beaten vocals vibrate through the dark. The spaces inside you where sound disembarks and softly remixes the beat of your heart. Oh, the siren. South London was a pasture once and will be once again. But in between the prioress and dizzy rascal, England was reset. Our voice collective like the black starlings murmur. Red fire of the front line now embers, the bleeding stanched, there is no riot here. Now faceless, sightless virus offers grim niceties where once they told it how it is. The boys in blue, they hated you, MPs, social workers too, spat in the street, killed students from the colonies and burned us. Put protesters in cells as psychopaths all night. By morning, all the evidence was lost, like a quarto known through works of other men. The coroner can archive every bruise, but rumour and the poet know the drill. No national restatement can disprove what Milton and the others said direct. What King Tubby started, Johnson would perfect. All history traversed, one beat to the next. All England in a single street traversed. The footwork of a shadow with a bomb thrown high comes to us in the tide marks where the brickwork was restored. Five nights of bleeding visible in stone. Dread, beat and blood came pouring that same year as Yorkshire's Ripper. Thatcher's Swamp, Altab Ali, Viv Anderson breaks out and Coldwell's shot. Ford closes due to strikes and strikers ration bread. The headlines then more striking than today's. Today's less striking than what is to come. The paradox of history as time descends is that it has been said, will be said again. The silence you keep in your heart every day. The ghosts of your conquest will keep peace away. The things that you know in your heart but don't say, oh the siren. The voice of a friend that you don't recognize Speaks only to that which supports all his lies The turning of heaven's a trick of the eyes Oh, the siren Libraries are very, very important um, as a human resource as a social resource, as a cultural resource. Libraries played a significant role in my life, particularly, in particular, 
the Brixton Library. Unfortunately, named after a guy named Tate. Tate Library in Brixton. I don't think I was, would have been able to get through my A-levels without access to that library. Um, at the time I was, I was, um, I wasn't that old, but I was a maturish kind of student. And uh, I had a young family, so it was a, um, a refuge of peace and quietness where I could go access books uh, for my A-levels because uh, I left school with six O levels, but no A levels, and I needed A levels to get into university. So you know, um, I don't I don't know what I would have done without Brixton Library. Um, it was a good place to hang out and meet people as well. I met all kinds of of people who, um, some of whom I later later on became friends with, who were when I met them were complete strangers. Brixton Library has another significance for me. Um, I think it was the first library I was able to find any books by Caribbean authors. I remember finding um, a novel or a collection of, of short stories called Miguel Street by V.S. Naipaul an anthology of Caribbean poetry edited by Andrew Salki called Breaklight, and a book by the Barbadian author Austin Clark. I think that was called Meeting Point. So it's the first time I ever came across um, books in public libraries which I could identify with and uh, you know, locate my own experiences in those books. Um, I think that was largely down to the excellent librarian we had in Brixton was a woman, an English woman called Janet Hill. And Janet Hill um, did all she could during her tenure to make the, 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 the library um, accessible for everybody, to make it inclusive, if you like. Very, very nice lady, Janet Hill. <clears throat> and I don't know if she had anything to do with it, but I suspect she did. But the library in the London Borough of Lambeth in 1977 um, had a fellowship, a writer's fellowship, called the C. Day Lewis Fellowship, um, named after the English poet Cecil Day Lewis. And I was lucky enough to win the C. Day Lewis Fellowship. And I was based at Brixton Library. That was my, my, my base. I was based at Brixton Library for nine months. And uh, I think I did two days a week or something. Uh, people would bring me their writings and I would write little comments uh, and give them advice and so on. You know, not, not, that, I, not that I was any expert, <laughs> on writing, I was just still learning my craft, you know. There you go. So, yeah. Um, Brixton Library, that library, played a pivotal role in my own development. I love libraries. <laughs>